So let's say, you know, your mom got this property and it was worth 300,000 like a hundred years ago. And now she's getting up there in age and she's like, you know, honey, why don't I just give it to you? You can take care of it. And now it's worth like 1.4. Prices today versus the prices in three years from now are going to be very different. Do you have any advice for someone that's trying to time the market or like trying to really find that special property? Like, what do you tell them? First of all, when somebody puts a property on the market, they should start really looking then. Take that listing period and that escrow period to really go shopping. Only real mistake, two mistakes, I guess. And I don't know if the first one's a mistake. They don't start looking early enough. Okay. So they really get stressed out. And secondly, when they identify property, they have to put the correct addresses down. <laughs> I'm not kidding. If they put the wrong address down, they can't make any changes to their identification notice after the 45 days. Yikes. All right, today I'm so excited because I have the dear Julie Bratton here on the call and we're just going to talk about 1031 Exchange. Um, I initially met Julie and I know I've known your name, but it was at the Nahele presentation with DR Horton where you were talking about 1031 Exchange opportunities. And as a realtor, I was like, I know a lot of this, but I forgot it or like it's just not relevant sometimes when you don't think of it all the time. And it's such an incredible tool to use as a homeowner in the future. So we're gonna do some myth busting and just a little bit of basics, but Julie, hello, welcome. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so excited yeah. to see you. Um, real quick before we dive in, how did you get involved with 1031 Exchange? Like what was your career path to doing this? Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Well, I don't, I've done a lot of things, Yeah. but um, I have a degree in interior design from San Diego State and I moved to Hawaii years ago and I thought, long story short, I could get into real estate. You know, I have the vision or whatever. Yeah. So I started selling real estate, I think in 90, the beginning of 94. Mm -hmm. So I started my career doing that. And, you know, the market was up and down. I was like, uh, what should I do? So I, at that point, became a transaction coordinator for the top producers at the company that I was working for. So I learned a ton there. And then a type, then older public title scooped me up. We need a program like that. So I did that for a little bit and then exchange came out and I was like, mm, I, yeah. can, I could do this because I knew how to sell real estate. I know title and escrow. So I kind of fell into it. And that was 23 years ago. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So you've been, doing, you're the pro, you're the island pro guaranteed. Like no one else knows it like you. <laughs> yeah. I, I hope so. I, it's, a, it's a lot. I mean, everybody has a story, but the rules are still the same. So it's yes. just interesting how to gather information and get people on the right track. Yeah, for sure. And I think one of the biggest assets you have is that experience because every situation is going to be different and you've helped so many different families navigate those differences. And so when you're in an emergency, it's like, who are you going to call? You're going to call Julie. <laughs> She's going to help yeah. you. But hopefully we catch it before it's an emergency. Yes. Uh, yeah. No emergencies if we can help it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So give us the rundown. What is 1031 exchange? Okay. So an exchange is a way to defer paying capital gains tax. And it's just for the sale and purchase of properties held for investment mm -hmm. or for productive use in a business or trade. I guess that's the textbook definition. So like, for example, personal residences don't qualify. Mm -hmm. so it has to be investment for investment. And you have to do this within you know, a specific period of time. But I do think a lot of times people say, okay, I'm going to do an exchange, sell my investment property and buy a property I'm going to live in. I mean, you can't do that right away. So it has to be investment for investment. I mean, no one says you have to hold it for investment forever, yeah. but you know, up front, your intent needs to be to hold for investment. Yeah. Okay. So run us through that timeline. Let's say we're ready. Is it when we close it, the clock starts on selling the home or when you start? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So an exchange needs to be set up before the escrow closes. Like put it this way, nothing can close without an exchange being set up. Mm -hmm. So you know, what do I do? I got to copy the contract and the title report and I draft exchange documents. E escrow gets everything set, but the day of closing is critical okay. because escrow is going to disperse money. I mean, if they give the money to the client, the client's toast. Yeah. You know, no exchange. They're going to pay taxes. Not the money. They're going to do an exchange. Yeah. If they're going to do an exchange, the funds come to us and we hold them until they're ready to buy the replacement property. So yes, the clock starts ticking the day they close. Okay. And here, here's the clock. They have 45 days from the day of closing to identify in writing what they're going to buy okay. and 180 days to close on it. So mm -hmm. the 45 days is included in the 180. They don't get 45 and then an additional 180. Yeah. And every day counts. So for example, a 45 day lands on Easter Sunday, they still need to identify by midnight 
of Easter Sunday. If the 180 days lands on a holiday or a weekend, let's say Christmas, they might have to close on the 179th day or the 178th day. So there's no extensions yeah. unless we're a victim of a natural disaster. Okay. Okay. That the government, the government recognized like the Lahaina fires. Yeah. They put out, they gave them an extension. So let's say we mess up and we miss the timeline. They have to pay capital gains tax. Yep. That's what it is. Okay. Your so that's a lot on your neck. Like what is the capital gains tax? For someone selling so it depends on their tax bracket but you have federal that's 15 20 percent depending on your bracket you have the state tax seven and a quarter and above then there's depreciation recapture that's taxed at 25 percent, and then the 3.8 affordable care tax if that applies to you so it adds up quickly yeah. so that's probably the number one reason why people do exchanges they just do not want to pay yeah and so I think the the roadmap of this is to use this over and over and over. Maybe you're starting with a condo, but then you can get up to a multi million dollar, if not multi gen property, um, and that's cash flowing major over the years. But then eventually you're going to have to pay capital gains tax. So what does that look like at the end of the road? Do people put it in? Well, a okay, that's a good question. Yeah. So to back up a little bit, yes, there are a lot of variations in an exchange. So you can sell one property and buy three. You can sell two properties and buy one. I mean, there's a lot of very, I'm just using those numbers, but you can, there's so many variations, but again, it's a deferral of tax, mm -hmm. not a getaway from paying tax forever. So you can continue to defer, defer, defer until you pass away. Yep. Then your kids or whoever is inheriting your property inherits it at a step up in basis, which okay. is great. They don't inherit the capital gain burden. They just pretty much get these properties. Okay. But some people do exchange, exchange, exchange into something they eventually want to live in. Mm -hmm. If they make it their forever home, again, fine, you pass away, your kids inherit it. Yep. Or you, you can prorate, you could take advantage of the personal residence exemption and your investment property um, after a certain amount of time. So there's a formula. So if you outright sell the personal residence, you're not going to get 100% of your 250 or 500. It's, it's a prorated formula, okay. but at least you can take advantage of a little bit of both, yeah. but you'll have to pay taxes on the difference. And if you would just outright sell, you're going to pay taxes. So yeah. let's say you did exchange, 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 and then now you have this one property and you're like, I'm going to sell it. I'm taking a loss or I don't want to be a landlord anymore. I'm tired of okay. this. I'm just going to sell. If they outright sell, then they're going to go back to the first property they did an exchange with because that followed yeah. that. This just follows them around. Ah. Some people think, oh, I'm just getting out because I'm not, this is, you know, not so great mm -hmm. right now, or I'm taking a loss or I don't want to be a landlord. They have amnesia. They forget that they did five exchanges into it. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. And you're paying the tax on all five at the end. Yeah. You're going back and calculating. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is why. Well, not you and I. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I mean, there is strategy to this. It's not just like willy nilly whenever I feel like it or whatever. Like you do need to know your numbers and have an exit plan at the end of the road. Um, what is the best situation? It's to have it be inherited to your kids. You don't have. To well, yeah. It. So if you I, it's my understanding and, you know, the law can change. And yeah, I can't get tax advice, but it, it's my understanding. It's better, obviously, to inherit property because you get it at a new basis. The step up mm -hmm. if you give the property to your kids while you're alive they have your basis okay so let's say you know your mom got this property and it was worth three hundred thousand like a hundred years ago yeah and now she's you know maybe getting up there in age and she's like you know honey why don't i just give it to you mm -hmm. uh you can take care of it and now it's worth like 1.4 yeah. okay so now she gives it to you it's worth 1.4 she passes away or you want to sell it, your basis mm -hmm. is really her 300. Wow. Yeah. So you get the step up. Yeah. yeah. That. So okay. it's better to step up if you can, in my opinion, but you know, everybody's financial plan is yeah. unique. For sure. Um, can you take two investment properties and then roll it into one exchange for a bigger property? Or it has to be- Yes, absolutely. Property? People do that all the time. So you can sell two properties to buy one. Okay. So let's say you were selling two properties, 500 each. Mm -hmm. The replacement property would need to be equal to or greater than a million dollars if you want to have 100% deferral. Yep. And when you sell two to buy one, you go off the clock, the time frames of which okay. the first property sells. Got it. Okay. So you'll start the 4,580 days. So the second one just needs to close in time. 
The sure. 45 days isn't really going to matter because you know what you're going to buy because you identified it in the first 45 days, but yeah. it has to close in time to make your closing date. Yeah. Um, hey, ladies, real quick. If you are looking for a mentor, I just wanted to remind you that I offer mentorship to entrepreneurs. So if you're someone who has a never ending to do list and you're spiraling out of control and feel like your business doesn't have a track plan, I want to work with you every single week for a month at a time super simple, but I come from over 10 years of experience doing this myself. And now I'm willing to give that information back to people. So I've mentored real estate agents. I've mentored wedding photographers. I've mentored other business owners and they've come from a place of overwhelm mostly. And they really just needed clarity and a couple of action steps to move the needle. And we've seen gigantic leaps and bounds in their business. Like I can't even tell you. So if you're interested and you want to know what that looks like, I want you to go to marinatolentino.com. And there's a Calendly link there to do a 15 minute discovery call with me just to see if we're a good vibe check to make sure we're on the same page. And I would love to work with you one-on-one -on -one to really boost your business to the next level. Let's dive back in. Um, as far as people worried about finding the replacement property, like 45 days is kind of a tight timeline, especially if you have a high criteria list. Do you have any advice for someone that's trying to time the market or like trying to really find that special property? Like, what do you tell them? Okay. Well, I do have a little bit of advice on that because mm -hmm. recently I'm changing my stories up a little bit mm -hmm. or my examples. So first of all, when somebody puts a property on the market, they should start really looking then. So take that listing period and that escrow period to really go shopping, you know, weed out the areas, the properties, the projects, the islands, the states they like, and they don't like. So when they're in their 45 days, they're not really stressed out. Cause yeah, if you wait, Till day one, 45 days can be yeah. really super stressful. So, you know, start shopping early and look mm -hmm. around. Um, the other thing I am noticing that kind of gets in people's way is they're looking for perfect. Yeah. And remember, it's just an investment property. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're not going to live there. You're not going to marry it. You're not stuck with it. I mean, of course, disclaimer, don't buy a piece of junk. But if you had to make a lateral move, just to defer paying the capital gains tax, do it, mm -hmm. you know, hold on to it for a year or so. And if you still don't like it, you can always sell it again and get into something you really want when it becomes available or when things calm down. But I mean, I have people every once in a while, be like, I'm just gonna pay my taxes. I can't find anything. And I had this one lady say that she yeah. said, I'm so picky. I can't find anything. And I said, well, why are you so picky? You're not going to marry the property. She wasn't planning on living in it. Okay. Eventually down the line. And I yeah. said, um, you know, make a lateral move. Don't pay taxes on 200,000. Mm -hmm. She was like, oh, okay, I'll think about it. And then, then on the 45th day, she called and she identified something and she bought it. Like she was kind of getting in her own way. She was, look, yeah. she didn't realize she was looking for perfect, but yeah. what does she care? As long as it, it, you know, works for her, mm -hmm. it pays for her. It, it, it serves its purpose. It's great. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. Don't get in your own way. Okay. I feel like there's so many people who are sitting on these properties and they want to move, but they just don't know how to make the move. Um, what advice do you have for them? Where they're just like, they've had it for 20 years. They might not even be on the Island. Like why should they sell it? or, you know, whatever. It's just getting up. Well, and you know, is it an, is it an old property? Is it dilapidated? Does it need a lot of maintenance? Is it still Let's working for you the way like, it used to? It's 20 years old condition. Yeah. I mean, I, for me, I could look at it as doing estate planning, you know, sell that old property that you've owned for 20 years and buy a few new condos or buy a few new houses, one for each kid or something. I mean, do some estate planning. Yeah. I mean, your kids probably don't want that old and dilapidated nope. property anyway. Yeah. So, you know, it's giving your investment properties a facelift and hopefully your pocketbook. Mm -hmm. And then, you, and also because you're not paying any for any more deferred maintenance, you're getting into something that's newer and, and fresher and more desirable yeah. and people pay more rent for that. Yeah. People take pride in, in their properties. That's true. And that's going to roll into that. So if you were to buy new construction, you have one year builder warranty, and then a lot of other things are covered for a while too. So you're getting nothing, no repairs needed usually in the first couple of years. The rental value is way, way higher in new construction. Appreciation value is way, way higher in new construction. Like it's just win on win on win. Um, so it's like silly, but I just feel like for some reason, everyone's sitting on the bench. Like, I don't feel like anyone's making the move to do a 1031 exchange to new construction, or at least I haven't heard of it. So have well, you I think the problem, the problem with that is the new construction. If it's not, if it's new right now, then yeah, yeah. they should just do it. 
But if it's like one of those new projects that are going to come up in 2025 or 26 oh, no. or 27, yeah. all of those, <clears throat> they're probably timing the sale of their relinquished property. Mm-hmm. So they sell that and they can close on that new project in 180 days. But I think they're stuck on, they have to put the down payment down today. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they get that down payment back in an exchange. So let's say I put down my own out-of-pocket deposit mm-hmm. today for a new project. Okay. And now down the line, it's going to be done at, let's say the end of 2026. Okay. I'm going to get my loan by the project. I can be refunded for my out-of-pocket deposits. As soon as my relinquished property sells, yeah. I'm good. you're going to take those proceeds, do an exchange, replace your out-of-pocket money. You get that money back. Yeah. I feel like people think the money's just going to be gone. Yeah. But it's just, and it's not going to be gone. Yeah. And like you said, there's like zero carrying costs. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and yet you have built in price. appreciation. Yeah. yeah. What's crazy with those bills is you're getting the price of 2024, but you don't like own it until 2026. What do you think the market's done in those two years? That property value's already gone up. I think that's a huge home run for people. Yeah. Yes. I know that. And actually I'm, I'm delving into that myself for the first time mm-hmm. buying into a new project. Exciting. And I'm like, you know, the prices today versus the prices in three years from now are going to be very different. Yes. So getting into it now mm-hmm. was really important to me. Yeah. So I'll let, yeah. Cross my fingers. I'm sure yeah. it'll be fine. That's exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. But I think people don't pull the trigger because they don't want to spend the money today. But they're going to end up spending the money later and it's going to be more expensive. So it's hard. Yeah, you're going to be kicking yourself. Um, okay, talk to me about the cost of a 1031 exchange. What's like the closing transfer fee, all of that, like from title? And okay, so it's fairly easy. I mean, you're going to have your normal 1031. You're, I'm sorry, you're going to have your more your normal escrow fees. Yep. And so usually when you go to escrow fees are usually about 1% of the sales price. Mm-hmm. And I think the escrow company gives you a... 30% discount on title and escrow if you're an investor. So that's always nice. Yeah. Okay. But my fee is the 1031 fee is usually $950 when you sell the relinquished property okay. and $575 when you buy the replacement property. So you pay as you go. Yeah. For example, if you don't find anything, obviously we're not going to charge you. So that's like nothing compared to what you're going to pay in taxes. Like okay. it, you can do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you see any common mistakes or like whoopsies that people are making with 1031 exchanges? The only real mistake, two mistakes, I guess. And I don't know if this is the first one's a mistake. They don't start looking early enough. Okay. So they really get stressed out. Yeah. And secondly, when they identify property, they have to put the correct addresses down. (laughs) I'm not kidding. If they put the wrong address down, they can't make any changes to their identification notice after the 45 days. Yeah. So if the address is wrong and it's after the 45 days, I cannot fund it mm. and um, they'll pay taxes. Yeah. That sucks. I mean, that's, it's just so weird, but it, it happens. Yeah. It happens once in a while. And you know, the IRS does not have wiggle room for a mistake on that. Yeah. They just don't. Um, okay. So we're shopping for properties. Hypothetically, we're just emailing them to you as we are looking at them and considering them or how does it work? Okay. So I give you guys an identification notice. Okay. And you're going to list the addresses, the complete addresses, including the unit number of what you think you're going to buy. Okay. You don't have to have an accepted offer when you identify, but you ha- it has to be on your list. So I'll give you the identification notice and I need it by midnight of the 45th day. Got it. And so there's two ways to identify on that list. There's the three property rule where you can identify just up to three. Okay. You might only want to buy one, but a lot of people put backups down just because they're not sure what they're going to get. So just because, which is fine. I think that's the most common way. Mm-hmm. If you wanted to identify more than three, so four or more, yeah. you can, but the fair market value of all of them combined mm-hmm. cannot exceed double or 200%. Okay. Same thing of what you sell the relinquished property for. So if you sell something for a million and you want to identify four or mm-hmm. five or 10, that whole list cannot exceed one penny over 2 million. It's like, you can't go crazy and identify all yeah, of yeah. and pick one later. Yes. Got it. So identification, I mean, there's a lot of gray area in exchanges, but there's also some black and white and identifying timely and properly is black and white. Yes. It's really important that it's done timely and properly. Yeah. Good to know. 
Hey, I'm sorry to interrupt, and I hope you're enjoying this episode of the Work Like a Mother podcast. Real quick, I just want to remind you guys, if you are worried about missing an episode, you don't have to worry anymore because we are creating a weekly email that's going to go out automatically every single time there's a brand new episode. And this email is going to have everything you need to know about this week's featured guest. It's going to have all of the links and the resources that we're going to talk about in this episode. So you don't have to go around and fumble through the show notes, but it's going to be served in your inbox every single week. So if you guys want that access, be sure to click below one time in the show notes today, sign up for that email, and then you'll never have to worry about it in the future. And bonus, if you really love this, we'd love it if you share this with a friend Give us a review on whatever platform you're listening to, and we'll continue to bring new episodes and new information that's going to help you level up your life every single week. Do you find that when people are buying the next property that they're just bringing in cash to make up the difference in the new price, or are they doing loans? Like, What do you see most commonly? Um, It's a combination. I think if people have cash, they're probably using their cash Mm -hmm. because you know the lending environment is a little bit sticky right now, Mm -hmm. but if they can get their loans that they'll get their loans, which is, which is a good comment to, for you to bring up because in an exchange, when you sell the relinquished property, mm-hmm. everything you read online, even my brochures, the, the, it says you need to replace the mortgage that you had on the relinquished property in the new property. Oh. And that translates into, you have to get another mortgage. Mm-hmm. You don't have to get another mortgage. You can replace it with cash. Yeah. But I think a lot of people take that for face value that it needs to be a mortgage because it says you need to replace the mortgage. You don't get debt relief. Yeah. So people are like, I can't get a mortgage or maybe I'm retired and I can't afford them. You know, I can't get a mortgage now. Well, okay. Well, you can go to the bank and bring in cash if you want. You just have to replace it. Got it. Okay. That's helpful. Oh, Um, and one other thing, one other thing that I could have brought up earlier is like kind. When you do an exchange, And remember I said investment property for investment. It also needs to be like kind property and like kind property is any combination of real property. That also translates a little bit funny to the client. It translates as it's, as if it needs to be condo for condo, single family for single family, Mm -hmm. vacant land for vacant land. And all, all, although all of those examples are perfectly fine, Mm -hmm. it's any combination of real property. Got it. So you can sell a condo and buy a commercial building. You can buy a, sell a commercial building and buy houses if you want. As long as you're using them for investment, you're good. Yeah. I mean, the world's wide open. You can get into so many fun things. Like I feel like yeah. commercial could be where it's at. Do you do a lot, do you do a lot of commercial ones? I do. Yeah. I do a lot of commercial. What's like pros and cons of switching from residential to commercial? I don't know anything mm-hmm. about the commercial world. Um. I don't know. I think you just look at the numbers a little bit differently, but it's still real estate. As far as the exchange is concerned, you're still deferring the capital gains tax, just like you would a residential one. But commercial, um, there's a lot more avenues you have to look at. Mm -hmm. That I'm, yeah. Do you know in the commercial zone, like, is the appreciation just as fast as residential? You know, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. per se, but on a commercial building, you want to make sure all your spaces are leased out. Mm-hmm. So the world has changed since the pandemic. Yes. So does that lessen the value and the, uh, of the commercial building? Probably. Mm-hmm. But I'm thinking so like, with, the, like the cap rates are really important. Yeah. But if you can, if you have a good house or a good condo and it's making, you know, making a lot of money, you, you know that it's going to be rented. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Like commercial I spaces in Y and I, and there's like a tire shop for sale. And I'm like, I wonder what that would be like, or there's another one that's, um, it's an auto body shop, but people are looking for those all the time. Cause so many warehouses don't allow car areas. And so it's just interesting to think. Well, that would be good. Yeah. But like the, the first one that you mentioned, like, why isn't it surviving? Is it the mm-hmm. business itself or is it the location? Is it the yeah. property? You know, what's the maintenance fee? Mm-hmm. You know, what's all of that stuff all matters. And I think on commercial um, financing, the lending is different. The lending requirements are a little bit different. Yes, for sure. And the rates are way cheaper Uh, too, but the income requirements are different. Yep. Yeah. Um, So, mm -hmm. you know, you have the smaller or the newer or the younger, if that's what you want to call it, investors moving up into commercial. And then you have the commercial people maybe doing some estate planning and getting into residential. I mean, 1031 exchange is a great way to do some estate planning. Yeah. 
That's also, exciting. besides building wealth, you're building wealth for your family or you're building wealth for you. I mean, it, it goes both ways. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty interesting. That's true. Um, for the people who want to live in it eventually, what's the rule? How long does it have to be an investment until they can actually occupy it? <clears throat> there is no rule or law on how long you have to hold investment property for investment. So just know that. It's all about your intent. Did you okay. intend to hold it for investment? And if you were audited, you should prove it. I mean, I like to say at least a year. Yeah. Because you can clearly show on one year's tax returns your intent. How you reported one year of income to the IRS, how are they going to argue that? But really yeah. the right answer, and I only like to say that. The right answer is the longer the better. So it's not measured by days, weeks, months, or years. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. That's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have people that say, oh my gosh, my life changed. I had to move into it. Okay. Okay. You know, that's between you and your CPA. Yeah. But up front, it needs to be held for investment. Yes. Yep. And same thing for the VA loan or whatever. Like you have to have intent to live there for one year. Uh, life can happen, but that makes sense. Okay. Um, I feel like this is really good. Do we miss any area that you feel like common FAQs or people might want to know? Um, no. Well, one thing mm -hmm. that seems to be very popular right now, again, everybody is stressed out about finding a replacement property because of the inventory that yeah. we're in. There is a reverse exchange. Oh, tell me more. Where you buy first and then sell. Oh, yes. It's more expensive to do it. And you have to have cash on hand to do it because you have to be able to buy it. And it's, it, there's a lot more involved in it, but you can buy first and then sell. It's called a reverse okay. exchange. And that time frames are in reverse also. So you would have to sell your relinquished property in 180 days. Mm -hmm. But some people are liking or warming up to the idea because they're so stressed out about finding a replacement property. Yeah. They rather just find one first because they always know they can sell the relinquished. Yeah. So as long as they don't mind the fees on that, they can do it. It's okay. just, you know, if you, from a fee perspective, if you can sell first and then buy, you should do it. Yes. Got it. It's more like if you're a worry wart, then you can buy first. We get it. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is a, a dumb question, but you can do a 1031 exchange in between states, right? It doesn't have to be like, I have to sell Hawaii to buy Hawaii. Yes. Yeah. Good question. Uh, anywhere in the U.S., mm -hmm. the U.S. Virgin Islands and Guam. Cool. Just not Puerto Rico. And I don't know why they left that out. Okay. But yeah. So foreign sellers can do exchanges, mm -hmm. but all the properties that they sell and buy still need to be within the United States. Got it. Okay. Yeah. No, I okay. think this is really That's good fun. to like trigger some thought provoking ideas for people who maybe have heard of the term, but never knew exactly what it was or how to do it. Um, we'll make sure that the editors will throw in here your contact information at the end too. So we'll get your little picture up and all of that. But I okay. think people just need to have the conversation. They need to call you and say, hey, Julie, this is my property. What does it look like to do a 1031 exchange? Yeah, I mean, there's no there's no harm in asking about it, learning about it, planning mm -hmm. for it for the future. I mean, you just don't know, but it is one of the last tax loopholes we have. Yeah. And it, it's it's good. Mm -hmm. It's really good. And everybody wants a piece of Hawaii. Yeah. Like maybe you have clients that own property here, but they have family members on the mainland that are dying to get here. Mm -hmm. Okay. They sell that property or their investment property, buy, mm -hmm. do an exchange, come into Hawaii, rent that out for however long. And then, Hey, maybe yeah. they move here one day. You know, there's just so many, yeah, so many ways to make that happen. But I do like the new construction situation. Yeah. I think it's a home run. It's just, people got to be open-minded to it. So I know. And I remember when I, when I talked to you at that, that presentation, my, yeah. my light bulbs were going off too. I was like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. You have a lot of, you have a lot of great ideas. I was just like, I came home and I was like, we should do this and we should do that. And yeah. I was uh, very so literally excited. Right after that, we put ours for rent, our two bed with a bonus room. And we had five applications within three days and it rented at 3,600 for a two bed. I was like, oh, that's God. just, yeah. Crazy. Crazy. I mean, so, th those stories, you have to tell that story more often Yeah, because I don't think people realize. Mm-hmm how easy it is i shouldn't how i'm using that word yeah. life lightly but easy it is to build wealth with real estate yep it, so. it's really easy anyways cool. we just need the right people to link arms and we're going to take you to the finish line <laughs> exactly yeah exactly yeah. sounds good well thanks for having me yes absolutely this was fun so again we'll push out all your information so people can get to contact I think you also just share so much. You have these brochures and you have information. Um, so when we have listings, I'll make sure that we get little flyers from you. That'll be really helpful too. Oh, um, good, good, yeah. good. 
Thank you, Julia. Thank Julie. you. Thanks. Okay. I look forward to working with you. We got to get together Sounds outside good. of this. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.